I support Senate Bill 52. I'd like to take this opportunity to explain a little bit about the process and how this money will be used in my district as well as across the state. I'd like to thank um, the member from Bethel for his comments about the importance of this money being inside of the formula and the reliability that that creates for districts so that they can plan ahead. On the Kenai Peninsula, Mr. President, this increase to the BSA is going to be used to keep pools open and to make sure that kids as well as senior citizens and many people in communities across the Kenai Peninsula are able to use those pools to continue physical therapy, to continue in their passion of swimming and diving, and to continue many different things that are so important around those pools, the least of which is certainly not learning to swim and being able to swim when one finds themselves in water over your head. It's a pretty darn important thing to know. This increase to the BSA keeps our pools open on the Kenai Peninsula. Also, Mr. President, this increase to the BSA keeps our theaters open and our theater technicians employed. Many times throughout the course of the year in the summer, um, school groups, kids involved in, in theater productions and musical theater, as well as our local community theater organizations, they utilize our theaters for productions that hundreds and thousands of people attend. The theater at the Kenai Central High School was known across the state for years and continues to be an important place for community concerts, political rallies, and many other things, many other things to be held. Without this increase to the BSA, currently the school district plan to close that theater along with others across our district. If folks are concerned about how money gets spent in your local school district, please get involved. Please get involved in that school district budget process so that you can see where the money goes. As we look at the percentage split between how money is spent on administration and instruction and instructional support, it is important to keep that in mind. However, as inflationary pressures have put pressure on school budgets, as the cost of insurance, whether it's health or property and casualty insurance has put pressure on school budgets, the percentage of money of all funds spent on instruction and instructional support has decreased because the whole pie of education funding has not increased with it. On the Kenai Peninsula, we have over the years, this is my 12th year being somehow involved in a school district budget, we would continually see over 80% of all funds, sometimes close to and over 85% spent on instruction and instructional support. That number has moved south closer to 80% and just a bit below because of the pressures that I just described. More resources dedicated to local school districts means that they can put more money in the classroom. And that's the bottom line. I appreciate efforts by some in this building to direct more money to teachers like me. I've been a teacher for 14 years, Mr. President. However, I cannot support those ideas and initiatives when those very pieces of legislation would give out a bonus to a teacher that says, thank you for serving the students of Alaska and their families and your community. And then the next week hand them a pink slip and says, I'm sorry, you no longer have a job because we didn't have the money in our base budget to fund your position next year. I certainly can't support any idea that would hand out a bonus or in an amendment that we saw today, Mr. President, not hand out a bonus because a teacher cannot sign a contract for the next year because there's no funding in the budget. Those are ideas I can't support. So we ask ourselves, and I am excited every day, as a speaker mentioned earlier in the afternoon, to have accountability in my classroom. And what does that look like? For many teachers across the state, their performance as a teacher is assessed twice a year. They get two assessments where they go through a litany of criteria that determines in four separate areas whether or not they are a good and effective teacher. Happens twice. Teachers later on in their career, they go through an evaluation process once a year that is very extensive on many criteria. Are you a good teacher or not? in many areas and then they make plans 
to get better every year, Mr. President. So we ask ourselves, and we all have to ask ourselves, who is accountable? We heard the term local control a lot. Great word. We use lots of buzzwords. They're awesome. What I hadn't heard yet today is personal accountability and personal responsibility for the education of the students of this state. When I hear people talk that they are a champion for educators, for students, I have to ask myself, what have you done? What have you done to support the learning of the kids in your life? Because what is going to make the process better? What is going to increase outcomes? I'll tell you, Mr. President, it's kids attending school every day. We have no attendance requirement in this state for kids to attend school. None. And yet we test those kids and then we decry schools because we assign them as ineffective when students who have not been in schools fail the test. People that send their kids to school and are actively involved in their students' education as parents, that is the number one determining factor on whether or not a student is going to be successful at school. Quality parents who are involved. So what can parents do? They can read to their kids. You got elementary school kids? Read to your kids 20 minutes a day, at least. When they're a little older, have them read to you. Review their spelling words. Go over your math. That's the accountability that we need. As a dad, I try to do that as much as I can. I see my wife working with my kids as much as she possibly can. And we've seen great gains from my son, Blake Bjorkman, in the past year because we made that a priority for our family. And the thought that somehow, through some measure of accountability, someone would force Blake, who is now growing and flourishing and quickly catching up to grade level performance, to force him to repeat the second grade because he's not quite there yet, that's an anathema to learning and progress and what we should be measuring as growth of our students instead of a bright line that just says where a kid is in relation to a test. There are countries that do that, Mr. President. Kids take a test, it's very high stakes, and that decides the rest of their education for their entire life. I don't think that's who we are. As I knocked doors this fall and summer, I met a couple of people who emigrated to our great state from Ukraine in the early 90s. They were upset with the quality of our schools. They were upset with the performance of our students. And they suggested to me, and I don't align myself with these views, but they are interesting, that we do things like they do it in Ukraine. And if students aren't attending school, if they're not turning in their homework, if their grades are poor, the parent's boss calls them into the office and said, oh, Mr. Jones, it's been reported to us by your child's school that they're not doing so well. Why don't you take some time off without pay so that you can help your son or daughter do better in school? That would be accountability, but I certainly don't support that. But how can we work together to make sure we answer the question, who's accountable? We all are. And when schools cannot hire enough teachers, when we cannot hire enough support staff in order to provide an education that is excellent for every student every day, we're failing in our duties. I agree with previous speakers that have said garbage in, garbage out. But right now, the vehicle of education in this state is running out of gas. And you can't expect that vehicle to take you to where you want to go unless you put the gas in the tank so that you can get there. Too many times we look at education in this state and we say, well, we pay good money, Mr. President. We pay good money for this education, and we do. But we need to look at our schools as a gym membership. You pay your money, and you go in and you do the work. You go in and you do the work to volunteer. You're a fan at those sports games. You go in and you support the kids in their education. Mr. President, as I talk here, I ask the members indulgence, but my high school days were marked by many people who supported my education. 
our football practices, our practices were attended by six to eight senior citizens who didn't miss a practice, Mr. President, because in the 1940s and 50s, they played football on the same field that I did. And they were proud of what I was doing. And then after practice or after a game, they would stop me and ask, Bjorkman, how are you doing in math? What are you going to do now after high school? And I knew that I was accountable to them because they cared about how I was doing, what my grades were like. That's the accountability we should focus on. What's not accountable, what's passing the buck, is treating public education like a vending machine. And you put in your $2, and you press the button, and you get a Dr. Pepper. That's it. There's no work involved there. You just pay for a product. That's not how education works. It should be a gym membership where you pay your money and then you go to work to do the work to be successful. If we treat education like every other government program, write a check and then I'm done, that will never work. If we want education to improve in this state, we've got to change the way we talk about it. You've got to be positive about education. I hear way too many people running down schools, running down teachers, running down support staff in schools, running down administrators who are trying their best to make sure that people improve in their educational outcomes. What I find offensive, Mr. President, is when people say, well, if you don't include X, Y, Z in a piece of legislation, that you don't care about kids. Nothing could be further from the truth, Mr. President. I'm proud of this piece of legislation and the work that's gone in. However, our work is not done. If people expect in this state for our schools to be able to provide vocational training and career and technical education, that costs money. Growing up in Upper Michigan, we had amazing opportunities available to us for vocational training because my community and my state chose to prioritize those things. We had a building trades program. We started in the fall with a hole in the ground. We poured footings in that hole and we built a house. And this time of year, we were putting the finishing touches on that house so it could be sold. We had a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning program, small engines, electronics. We had a nursing program in our schools, which I'm excited to hear start up at the Department of Labor again through the AHEC program, by the way, Mr. President. But we made all of those things a priority. We need to prioritize more of those things. And the reality of it is that those things cost money. You want to change educational outcomes? You've got to change the way you talk about it, and you have to change the way that people participate. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the time.